Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you all very much for coming this evening. You're most welcome. My name is Charles O'Connor. I am one of the vice chairmen of this committee, and I'm chairing this evening's proceedings. On my right are my fellow councillors, who, with me, will be making decisions this evening. I think I'll spare them all having to introduce themselves, uh, but here they are. And um, on my left, we're joined by officers. The senior of whom present this evening is Derek Taylor, immediately on my left, and then Katie Howell and Sarah Gentry, who will be presenting the cases that we're going to hear about this evening. There are other officers as well from the legal and governance teams, and we're very grateful to them for joining us. I'll introduce anyone else who needs to participate as we go along. Some of you will have been before and will recognize our procedure, but I'll explain it as we go along. One of the key points to make at the outset is that all the councillors have had the PACs and the information, and we've read those, and uh, the addendum reports have also been circulated to councillors. Um, so, moving to the formal agenda, uh, I think there are no apologies for absence. All the councillors are present. Are there any declarations of interest, colleagues? Councillor Adorian, first of all. Norris is a friend of mine, but I can confirm I haven't discussed this application with him, and I haven't had any involvement whatsoever. Okay, thank you very much. And Councillor Wade? Ditto. And Councillor Idris, I think. Uh, same. I guess the Lloyd Norris kind of gets around. <laughs> <laughs> He's everybody. Everyone uh, knows yes, Lloyd Norris. Also, I would like to add uh, one of the... Um, Cases is in my ward. However, I've never um, discussed it or learned about it. Until okay. Yeah, thank you. Lovely. Thank you very much indeed. They're all noted for the minutes. Uh, there are some minutes of a previous meeting for me to sign. If colleagues are prepared to authorise me to do so, it's a true and accurate record. This was a meeting of the on the seventh of September, chaired by me uh, and Councillor Idris. You were the only person who was here. Are you happy for me to sign those as a true and accurate record? Thank you very much. And then moving to the running order for this evening, we're going to start with the application at Leonard Court, then Hans Crescent, then Earls Court Road, then Grove House in Chelsea Manor Street, then Uverdale Road, then... Royal Court House on Sloan Street, then Clarendon Walk and Talbot Walk, then Iverna Court, then Boyne Terrace Mews, and finally Tavistock Crescent. So we will move to Leonard Court first of all, and that is Katie Hull, I believe. I beg your pardon, it's Sarah Gentry, I'm so sorry. So this application relates to a basement flat um, that is located on the southwestern part of Leonard Court um, next to the vehicular entrance, as you can see on the photograph um, there. Um, the site is located just outside um, the Edward Square, Scarsdale and Abingdon Conservation Area, um, although it should be noted that the council is currently reviewing the boundaries of the um, conservation area and subject to the consultation process, um, it is likely to be included within the conservation area in the future. Um, the planning history for this site is particularly relevant. This is um, obviously set out within the officer's report but I just want to draw your attention briefly to um, a couple of these applications. Planning permission was granted in 2006 for the use of the basement storage area to be used as a flat. And a certificate has been issued um, to say that this permission has been implemented and so can be carried out in full. And that 2006 permission also included um, windows to elevations. And then planning permission was subsequently granted in 2011 for a light well 
um, but that permission expired. Um, an application was made in 2017, which was refused and appealed. Um, the inspector found the proposal acceptable in all respects, apart from the need for information to be provided on archaeological remains. And then finally, um, an application was made in 2018 and permission was granted for a light well to provide access to the basement flat and also to alter the pavement and um, to continue around the light well. That permission is now run out and which is why um, the applicant has reapplied and the application under consideration tonight um, is for the same proposal as was previously granted permission. So the per permission is sought for a proposed light well to the south side of the building as indicated by the arrow on the slide. New windows are also proposed on all elevations. Um, this is the south elevation of Leonard Court and new windows and a door to the light well are proposed which would match those windows above. It is proposed that the light well would have black metal painted railings and also that the pavement would be extended around the light well and repaved in York Stone. The gate post would be removed, however this does not um, need planning permission in itself. And the Director of Transportation and Highways has confirmed that whilst the width of the, of the driveway to Leonard Court would be reduced, it would still be sufficient for large vehicles, including emergency vehicles, to gain access. New windows also proposed on the elevation fronting onto South Edwards Square, again designed to match those above, and also to the north elevation, new windows would be formed. And this last slide just shows um, that there is an existing light well to the eastern side of the building, which you can just see on the right-hand side of the slide. That's all I think I need to say by, by means of introduction. Thank you very much indeed. So we now move to hear from the objectors to the scheme. And we have three, seemingly, registered objectors. And as you may know, you have three minutes between you. And it's up to you how you divide those three minutes up. But I will let you know when the three minutes are up. So when you're ready, please. Hello, thank you. Uh, my name is Lloyd North. Uh, I'm a trustee of ESSA, which is the Edward Square, Scarsdale and Abingdon Association. It's the charity for the conservation area uh, and the area around Leonard Court. And as the officer has already pointed out, uh, there is currently a review of the conservation area and it is fully expected that Leonard Court will form part of the conservation area. In any event, uh, the conservation area review has been delayed somewhat. It should have been some years ago, and we were promised that it was, this would be completed by September. However, we understand that it should be about six weeks away. So this application comes just before the conservation area review completes. And as a trustee of this, I also chair the mansion block group, so I have quite a lot of knowledge in how these mansion blocks should be preserved. And I was here only two weeks ago for another mansion block in exactly the same situation where they were trying to alter the outside of the building. Leonard Court is a very historic Art Deco mansion block in the area, and this, uh, this two facades would greatly impact on the outside. Um, also, we know that Leonard Court is to be included in the conservation area. But the consultation, the second part is the consultation hasn't been good on this. The, the applicant has not consulted with the neighbours, and this is something that is going to affect everybody in the block. Literally everybody in the block is going to see the outside of their building that they're a leaseholder to altered significantly. And that we think that the leaseholder, as well as the council, should have, could have, should have spoken to all the people in the building. It's only 46 other flats in the building, so it's not a big consultation. And my final point is that if, if it, it is not rejected, 
can this application be delayed until the review has been complete? And we would also plead that the existing gate peer, an original Art Deco feature, is retained, and we would question that, it, that we have a report to say that emergency vehicles would not be able to get through the gate post. We will be removing an original Art Deco gate post, which would ruin the symmetry to the entrance of the building. Thank you. My name is Patricia Sunley, and um, I've owned a flat at Leonard Court for over 20 years. And from the start, I attended committee meetings and was involved. It was clear the freeholder was not interested in any consultation with owners, as evidenced when he gave notice to our resident porter so he could develop and sell the flat, which is next door. The Leasehold Reform Act in 2002 provided an opportunity for owners to run their own affairs, so we acquired the right to manage. A more recent attempt to maximize capital from the building was in 2010 when the freeholder applied, as we've heard, for planning to develop a flat in the basement. This was previously used as storage lockers for all residents. Again, no consultation. That permission was refused in 2010, and in his report, Jonathan Bohr notes many reasons for refusal, but they included that the applicant had failed to enter into adequate consultation with the leaseholders. So this gets repeated again and again, sadly. We've got major concerns. Among them, we need constant access to the space due to the fact that the guttering runs through the basement and it's necessary to be able to access this at all times for rotting of black blocked drains in block A. We're also concerned about the safety of the space reduction caused by the light well. In the 45 flats are many elderly residents and young children with prams. Add to this, there are many delivery service vehicles which have to back down and out onto a narrow road with tightly parked cars. Thank you All very much indeed. I'm afraid your time fine. is now up and you're slightly over, but I'll afford the same extended time to the agent of the applicant. Anyway, thank you very much indeed. All points well made, which we've taken on board. And now we have Mr. Taylor, the agent of the applicant, and you have similarly three minutes, 50 seconds, uh, if you'd like it, to explain why we should grant the application. Uh, thank you, Chair. And I think the planning officer and the report sets out very usefully the background to this. It is a proposal that has been previously considered both by the Council and the Planning Inspectorate, <coughs> and it has been found to be satisfactory in design terms. Um, and we heard that the appeal was dismissed only on for lack of an archaeological assessment, which has now been rectified. Um, this scheme has been designed by an architect, and I think even if the site, if the building is in a conservation area, uh, it certainly ticks the boxes by very carefully uh, matching existing features of this Art Deco block, both in terms of materials, the design of windows, the railings, etc. So it has been given very careful thought. And I'm quite confident that uh, I I even in a conservation area, this would, would get the thumbs up. Um, the, as the planning officer has pointed out in regard to the gate post, that would not need planning permission to be removed. And the reason for its removal is purely in the interest of pedestrian and highway safety because we wanted to make sure that with the formation of the light well, which clearly impinges on the existing pavement, that uh, any pedestrian users did not suffer any reduction in that pavement. So that's meant the pavement has been kicked out somewhat, but it still leaves 3.3 meters width for service vehicles uh, which the Director of Highways and Transportation is entirely happy with. Uh, I think those are the main points in terms of the substance of this scheme. It, it has been previously considered and found acceptable. And as the planning officer points out in the report, there's been no change in planning policy to warrant a departure from uh, the previous recommendation, the previous decisions, I should say. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much indeed. All very helpful points. Colleagues, we ha now have the opportunity to put questions to both the objectors and applicant, or applicant's agent, and uh, Councillor Wade, I saw your hand first. 
Uh, I think that uh, I, I do know the building, and I've actually had to drive and reverse out of that area. And I think that narrowing the area will actually potentially create an issue when you have to try and get out onto that street, which is directly off High Street Care. So I, I think that that perhaps hasn't been taken into consideration. Also, that if you have, and I believe you have some older and vulnerable people in that block, that actually what I'd be concerned about is emergency access uh, being available. Um, it is, you say, 3.5. If you have that light well actually at the entrance, I feel that that might obstruct. Have you ever, have you tried that? Have you actually tried uh, almost like a risk assessment of getting um, an ambulance or a fire brigade in, uh, engine into that? Uh, would, would a fire truck get in there? Uh, would you like me to answer that question? That, uh, that now? The agent, please. Uh, yes, certainly. Um, the, although we haven't actually asked a fire engine to drive into the, the service yard, what the architect has done, there are standard, the standard specifications for emergency vehicles, which architects rely on when they're designing their schemes. And he took into account both a fire tender and an ambulance to show, uh, and th these things are normally done with track diagrams to show how a vehicle can enter and exit. Um, so the, figure, the width of 3.3 meters is one that will accommodate um, those emergency vehicles. And furthermore, the Director of Transport will have reviewed all that. And according to the officer's report, he was satisfied that the access would be adequate for emergency vehicles. So we didn't do the actual driving a vehicle. We didn't do that element of risk assessment, if you wish. But there are standard dimensions of dust carts, ambulances, fire engines, all of which these uh, architects use in their day-to-day -day work. Thank you. I'm going to ask a very quick question, if I may, to the applicant's agent. Uh, am I right in thinking that this application is identical to the one in 2018? Or are there any changes? It is, apart from the date on the form. Thank you very much. Um, Councillor Ali. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, I see, as the uh, Chair mentioned, <coughs> uh, the application has been uh, uh, granted in 2006 and then moving forward to uh, an appeal and rejection and granted again an appeal and rejection. That's a history of um, appeal and, 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 and granting and rejection. But that's not the point that I wanted to raise with you as an agent. I would like to know why this uh, application has been forwarded today here without the final report of the conservation area. Because we, as we have heard, it's six weeks before we get the final report. Why, what is the rush? And if you can answer that. And if I can also ask the objector the same question, but slightly from different angle to say, why do you think the agent is moving forward without waiting, um, without having the final report and, and also consulting with the uh, neighbours who will be affected by, by, by the uh, warning or by the work is being done, if we were to grant it today or not. Thank you. If I were a judge in court, I probably wouldn't allow that second question, but I'm not, so uh, I will allow Councillor Ali to ask that, but it will, of course, be speculation on the part of the objectors. Anyway, uh, you can ask the agent that. Uh, yes, thank you, Councillor. Um, there was no intention to uh, rush this application in, and to be perfectly honest, um, our clients, and indeed ourselves, were not aware of this review of the conservation area. If, if I can just put in a bit of background, the timing of this application was determined largely by the circumstances of the uh, trustees who um, own the freehold. And there have been changes within the trustees uh, of late following the uh, death of the 
gentleman who set it all up some years ago. And the trustees have been working through the estate portfolio, and this is simply one that has come up through, you know, th as they work their way through. So it had nothing to do with the actual ex uh, extension of the conservation area. Um, I'd, li I'd like to actually contradict that because uh, Leonard Court were part of the consultation at the beginning of this year um, with um, the RBKC on the uh, timing for the conservation area review and we were told that it would be completed by September so it should have been completed by now there was a delay uh, we have been in touch with uh, Jonathan Wade and the council for the reasons for this delay um, but this is the second objection I've been to in the last two weeks at the council which is an art deco mansion block in the ESSA area that is applying to have an alteration to the outside of the building. It can, can't be a coincidence that this is happening now, and we don't believe that. Um, the, other, the other thing that I would say is that we do have a report that contradicts the emergency vehicle access to the building. Thank you very much. Councillor Idris. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, can you, um, Mr. Lloyd, um, can you tell us um, What's in the report that contradicts? I mean, how can you elaborate on that? I can maybe introduce myself. Uh, I'm Anna Hemmerley. I live at Leonard Court. I've lived there for over 20 years. And uh, the report we're referring to was submitted by an expert to in 2018 when the planning application went through in, in 2018 and it was an expert who deemed that the creation of a light well and the extension of a pavement around the light well would likely lead to emergency vehicles having to mount the pavement in to, to gain access and that, that would lead to much less uh, safety for, for residents to get in and out uh, when such vehicles would be in the present. And that, that was commissioned by us, the um, RTM company, but it was an expert on the matter. All right, thank you very much. It's probably worth noting that when we allow a, uh, a, a basement in a muse or something like that, we require three meters of clear road space, uh, and that's sometimes allowed to be less than three meters uh, in special circumstances. So 3.3 meters may be uh, ample. Councillor Dorian. Can you explain a bit more about why ESSA believes the application will harm the conservation area, or at least at present the adjacent conservation area? And it does appear, at least from looking at the proposals, that the, the fenestration at least is, appears to be sympathetic to the surroundings. So could you explain a little bit more about what the perceived harm will be? Uh, thank you, Councillor, yes. Um, well, in particular, the removal of the gate pier, yes, we understand it doesn't need planning permission. Anybody that has walked past that building will know that that is an original Art Deco gate pier with the name Leonard Court on it and the original lamp attachments to the top. And if you remove that pier, you can see that it's removing one half of the entrance gateway pier. Uh, also, the uh, facade that you saw on the screen, which had the corners, we've got two, two facades that will be altered from their original design. What we at ESSA are trying to do for our conservation area and have been for more than 50 years is to try and protect buildings like this. Um, the police station is another consideration. So we are trying to protect the Art Deco mansion block facade. This uh, proposal is not how that building was originally built. And it is very visible from street level what the changes will be. And it will be a, a major impact and a major change. It will be very noticeable. And we will have lost a piece of Art Deco heritage. Thanks very much. We'll talk to officers about the gate post a little more perhaps in a minute, but uh, I'd quite like to see a photograph of it if we've got one. But uh, I have a question for Mr. Taylor. Would your clients be amenable to keeping the gate post? Um, I haven't raised that with them, but I can say that the reason for removing it was purely for pedestrian safety purposes. And I would be unhappy 
if I felt that someone, perhaps pushing a push chair or whatever, or maybe in a wheelchair, had difficulty uh, in negotiating the pavement if that gatepost was retained. It's not heavily trafficked, but it is purely in the interest of pedestrian safety uh, that we've uh, removed it, we're proposing to remove it. Um, I would be nervous. I, I haven't specifically put this question to my client, but as a professional, and who's looked into these things, I, I would be somewhat nervous. That's fair enough. Thank you very much. Colleagues, any further questions for the applicants or the objectors? In which case, we will say thank you very much and we'll move on to discuss the issues with uh, Sarah Gentry. So, colleagues, uh, questions to Sarah. I'm going to start with one. Have we got a photograph of the gatepost or did I miss it? Um, I can. Th it is shown on the, the main photograph. Let me get that up. Thanks. So you, you ah. can see that the gatepost which we're talking about is obviously the one to the, the left-hand side of the photograph next to the building. I see. And just to confirm, you say that they could take that down without any permission at all? That's, that's correct. It's Why is that out of interest? Um, it's, it's demolition. It's not within a conservation area. Um, and so um, that that type of, of demolition doesn't require planning permission. Okay, thank you. Um, right, colleagues, any questions? I, I have another question then. If this were already a conservation area, would our view be exactly the same? It may not be, no. Um, this is, uh, um, pl planning permission is um, required for substantial demolition within a conservation area. Um, there are some permitted development rights on, with regard to um, boundaries, but um, to demolish part, a substantial part of a boundary would require planning permission. So you're talking about the gatepost there? Yes. Okay. Yes. And, and our view on the overall scheme as proposed, what how would that differ if we were already in a conservation area? Um, I mean, it's, I, I don't think it would differ um, a great deal. Um, obviously, our assessment um, now has taken into account the impact on the adjoining conservation area, um, and it, it should be noted also that when the inspector looked at the proposal, she particularly looked at the impact on the conservation area and took the view that the removal of the gatepost didn't cause, although regrettable, didn't cause um, harm to the character and appearance of the conservation area. Hmm. Okay, thank you very much. That's very helpful. Any questions? Councillor Wade. Have th I am still concerned about the emergency access. Um, I think the picture sh shows quite clearly the difficulties of coming out, out of that entrance. There's kind of a little lump, <laughs> and then you come down, you've got cars. Come, uh, it's, if you had to evacuate that building, you would have to have more than one fire truck. That is the exit. That is the way those people would exit that building, and I think that we have to think of that over and above the uh, the, the gain potentially of developing a, a unit. Uh, I'm ju I just because I know because I used to visit somebody there, and we used to have to get them into an ambulance. So I actually know the difficulties of getting the wheelchair out of there and into, a, uh, uh, into an ambulance. And it was restricted. And you almost had to have a, a banksman to get the, the ambulance out. So I really am quite concerned about the emergency thing. So what do you think? What advice can you give? 
Well, we have sp specifically um, had advice from the Director of Highways and Transportation on this. Obviously, they are the, the experts, um, and so we would, um, we would give a lot of weight to, to what advice that they give. And as, as said in the report, they do specifically say that the retained driveway, driveway width would be um, sufficient for large vehicles, including emergency vehicles. Can you, can you remember how many flats there are in that, that use that entrance? I, I think we said there were four, oh wait, that particular entrance. Yes, have no, I don't, I know there are 43 flats, aren't there, in the total in, within the building, um, but I understand there's, an, there's other entrances. But I, I take the point that obviously it's, it's, it is a substantial number it will be a substantial number of flats. Because you wouldn't be able to necessarily use High Street Can because of the pedestrian crossing on the other side. Yeah. Thank you. Councillor Duran, did you want to say something? Yeah. So what's, what's the reasoning behind that not requiring a planning permission to remove it? Well, within a, I will answer the question and then I may ask Derek Taylor if he wishes to add anything, if I may. Um, within a demolition of a building, indeed, outside a conservation area, um, wouldn't um, require planning permission. Lock down an entire building without requiring planning permission in order to do so. Okay. Yes, I mean it's not something that obviously within our borough much of much of um, most of the the buildings are located within a conservation area, so it's not something that we come across very often. Okay, N Councillor Idris, unless Derek wants to add anything. Um, Chairman, no, there's there's nothing that I'd, I'd add to that answer actually. Um, I mean, 75% of the borough is conservation area, so it's not something we come across very frequently. Thank you. Councillor Idris? Um, my, my, my concern is, um, it seems like this building pretty soon is going to be within a conservation area, but we're not treating it as such, even though it is not currently, but I'm hoping the future and in the future, there is a longer time and a longer period. And it's going to be, in a, I mean, we, I, I get the feeling it needs to be respected accordingly. But yet we're not giving it the respect it deserves right now. And I don't know how that fits in the planning uh, language. But I just feel, um, I'm, I'm a little bit disturbed that, you know, we can actually tear the entrance down and it's okay, when I feel that shouldn't be okay. I don't know whether there is a question in there or not, but you know, if you can help me um, feel okay about it. I, I'd just add to that, if I may. It is a good question, if there is a question in there, because sometimes we're faced with something like the intent to publish London plan, and people have to give that weight before it's published. So yeah. does the same apply here? Yes, in, in a sense, we can certainly give weight to the fact that it is likely that the um, building is going to be in a conservation area very soon. So when you are making the decision, you can take into account the fact that obviously the building isn't in a conservation area now, but at the same time, um, you can give, as I say, give weight to the fact that it is, it is likely to be in the near future. Thanks. And Councillor Ali, I think. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, it comes back to the conservation area and the, the report that has been mentioned before, which will be in due in about six weeks' time, and also the accessibility. Um, God forbid, but if there was a fire or, or an emergency required uh, for, for the number of flats you've mentioned, what would be the case 
in terms of accessibility, the number of vehicles, large vehicles, uh, firefighters coming in and all that stuff. So will there be any restrictions as we see it from here now? Will that be, will that, has that been taken into consideration? So can I just clarify the, the question? Um, are you asking whether um, it makes, ha, sorry, can you repeat, yeah. I will rephrase it. Rephrase um, it. If, I, if I were to go back to the original question I've asked it earlier, um, this uh, in terms of the, the report of uh, conservation, if you've just said, if this building or this area uh, should be or will be soon uh, as in a conservation area should be, uh, you didn't say as treat, treated as conservation, but give away to. Mm -hmm. What stops from now and the residents who feels that the decision making or the planning is a bit earlier, it can be time and should wait for that report. That's one point, just to rephrase what I've said earlier. And the second point is what Councillor Wade has mentioned in terms of accessibility and the, the number of properties and the number of people live in that area. Will it, wouldn't that be uh, s safe to reason or accessibility if emergency vehicles were to go into the area? So in terms of whether you waiting for the, um, the, the idea of, of, de of delaying um, the decision, obviously um, it, the application is, is in now, it's be before committee for a decision. Um, it's, it would be possible to delay it, but it's, it would be, um, I think the difficulty would be that although we, uh, we expect for the consultation and so on to go through or in around six weeks, there's no guarantee of that. We don't have a clear end point. Um, so that's not something that we would advise you to do. Um, that was the first question. The second question relating to emergency vehicles and the diff difficulties for access. Um, I would just go back to the point that we have been advised that there is sufficient width here um, for emer emergency vehicles to, to go through that um, driveway. All right, thank you very much indeed. I think we'll move on and thank you, Sarah, for your answers. And now, if any of my colleagues want to raise any points for discussion amongst us, we can do so. I don't know what people's thoughts are. For my part, I'm giving fairly significant weight to the fact that we've already granted this application. That bears very heavily in my view and uh, would do if we were to reject this and then it went to appeal and the planning inspector saw that we'd granted this before but there'd been no material change in planning policy in the intervening period. Uh, that has to be given considerable weight, but it's up to you how much exactly you give it. Um, and um, I also have in mind uh, 4.3 in our report where the um, summary of the inspector's views are set out and they, the inspector found that uh, the application, which we've heard is identical apart from the date, um, uh, would preserve the setting of the adjacent conservation areas. So she took into account that, okay, this wasn't actually in and still isn't in a conservation area, but a conservation area is very close and she didn't feel that the removal of the gatepost was going to damage the adjacent conservation area. So it's a question of whether we think it might be different and uh, we have to refuse this on the grounds um, uh, which I caution against given that the removal of the gatepost doesn't require planning permission but whether we think we need to re refuse on the grounds that this would harm uh, a, a conservation area that's about to be applied to this um, this building. So. Uh, Colleagues, any, any further comments? Otherwise, we'll move to a vote on the recommendation. No? Okay. Thanks very much. Well, the recommendation is that the committee grants planning permission with the conditions listed in section 9 of this report. Can I see with a show of hands those in favour of the recommendation, please? 
um, those against. Right, so uh, claim permission is not granted, um, and we therefore need to produce a, uh, a motion um, uh, and a reason for refusal. Um, so perhaps Sarah could help us with that. Would, um, would, I think there seems to be two main um, points of concern here. One, the impact on the character and appearance of the building and the um, adjoining conservation area. So um, I would suggest that that uh, reason for refusal along the lines that the proposed um, alterations to the building um, due to the introduction of a light well um, would be harmful to the character and appearance of the building and the adjoining conservation area, contrary to the relevant development plan policies. about obstructions to potential obstructions to pedestrians and vehicles accessing it as well so pedestrian the impact on pedestrian vehicle safety i think is an also important one and highway and pedestrian and vehicle safety about the sounds of things being the other reason um so uh does one of you want to propose um, uh, sorry Sorry, if I, could, if I could just add something to that. Um, as the building is not in a conservation area at this, at this point in time, which would be the time that you're refusing planning permission, the, um, the best wording would be the appearance of the building, not, not yet the character and appearance of the building because it's not in a conservation area, but it would be the appearance of the building and the character and appearance of the adjacent conservation area. Best okay. to segregate the two as it's not yet in a conservation area. Yeah. Well, um, what we normally do is allow the exact reason for refusal and the precise wording to be formulated afterwards, don't we? But um, uh, I think if Sarah's taken on board the broad reasons that uh, three of the councillors have voted against it, um, then that can be sorted out afterwards. Uh, and one of you needs to propose a refusal on those grounds and seconded um, Councillor Dorian and then Councillor Idris I saw first of all um, praised and seconded it and then we need to vote on that uh, motion and um, so can I see those in favour of the refusal of planning permission on those two grounds, three in favour and those against and two against. Okay so planning permission is refused on that basis. Thank you very much. And we move to Hans Crescent. Thank you very much, Chairman. The application site is the pedestrianised part of Hans Crescent. Um, I've included an aerial shot of the site um, on the screen there, although I'm sure you're all very familiar with the area um, I'm talking about. Um, you can see there Harrods on the left-hand side. Um, this photograph gives you um, an idea of the width of the road on this pedestrianised section. Um, so this is looking north from the Basel Street end of the road. Um, and then this photograph is taken looking south from Brompton Road. Um, you can see the canopies to Harrods on the right-hand side, um, and you can make out the entrance or exit to Knightsbridge Tube Station there. Planning permission is sought for the change of the use of the area shown on the plan for the placement of tables and chairs. Um, there would be a total of 47 tables and 94 chairs um, with associated heaters and planters. You have a scene from the report. Um, this is um, slightly unusual um, in its um, form of an application. Um, so a key factor in the determination of this application is the fact that that whole area within um, the coloured lines there is already covered by three pavement licences. Um, sorry for the text-heavy slide, but um, just a brief bit about pavement licences, which were introduced by the Business and Planning Act in 2020 um, in response to the COVID pandemic. Um, it was a measure introduced to try and support outdoor 
drinking and dining to help businesses. Um, and y if you have a look in your packs, it's probably easier to see the areas, but there are three separate pavement licenses covering this area, um, all of which were granted last year and have recently been extended up until the 30th of September 2022. Um, so, what does that mean in terms of this application? Um, well, in essence, it means that the area already has planning permission for tables and chairs. Um, I've included an extract on the screen there from the, the guidance associated with the Act, um, and it's clear there that the granting of a pavement licence um, means the applicant also benefits from deemed planning permission. Um, so, on this point, I just wanted to draw your attention to Condition 1 in the pack. Um, this is important because um, the recommendation is to grant planning permission, um, but subject to this condition, which would restrict the time frame for the permission up to September 2022. So that's to match the period covered by the licence. Um, so in other words, it covers the period that they already have deemed planning permission to put tables and chairs there. Um, Lastly, I just wanted to draw your attention to the um, pack in front of you and the um, additional material that's been circulated to you from the applicant. Um, I hope you've had a chance to skim through. Um, they have suggested that they would be um, open to um, entering into a unilateral agreement um, relating to this area to say that they would only use um, one of the areas for the placement of tables and chairs. Um, Officer's advice to you is that um, it's not appropriate or necessary in this case to have such an agreement in place um, and that that would fail to meet the tests within the MPPF. Um, it's important to note that planning permission goes with the land and matters of, of ownership, tenancy um, and which of the many premises on Hans Crescent use that space is not a matter for the planning committee to decide. Um, and, and that's the presentation, Chairman. Thank you very much. And we now have no speakers on this item. Uh, the objector withdrew, and therefore the applicant and the applicant's agent were ineligible to speak. Uh, and Councillor Wade would like to ask a question of Katie Hull, I think. There was one thing. I understand that it's the public highway. I, but actually what I couldn't work out is who would have the right to have their tables and chairs there. Sorry, having read through all the papers, I couldn't work out whether the, it's just the, the restaurants that overlook that area. Would, I mean, is there any type of... It, it's a very good question, and I think that, that um, as you've seen from the objections, it's a key factor that's been raised to us. Um, as I just mentioned, it's important to bear in mind that planning deals with the, the use of the land and matters of ownership, tenancy, and so, and so forth don't come into a planning decision. So um, if um, the committee were to go with officers' recommendation tonight and grant planning permission, you're in essence granting planning permission to change the use of that bit of the footway to put tables and chairs. Um, it's not in any way tied to the applicant, so it would be for Harrods, for Crazy Pizza. For so it could, it could be anybody. It could be anybody, and that's a, a matter for um, outside of this committee um, in order to be determined as to who puts what where. All right, thank you for that clarification. Sorry, for what committee? Um, sorry, outside of this committee, so oh, um, it, it wouldn't be through uh, the council, it would be um, a separate matter for them to decide. Thank you. Councillor Idris first. Uh, yes, um, I have a question. If, if um, my understanding when Hans, um, uh, where is it? Hans Crescent was pedestrianized, it was actually for the enjoyment of pedestrians. And it looks with 90, what is it, with 47 tables and 94 chairs and 42 heaters and 20 planters. How much space is left for the pedestrians? And, is, and, and what, how many tables and chairs do they currently have? Don't they, or is, is that the same number they have now? Um, so I'll, I'll answer your second question first, because that's the, the easiest of the two. Yeah. So um, under the current application, there would be two additional chairs. 
compared to the three licenses that are in place. So um, very little difference. The actual area for tables and chairs doesn't change at all. It would all still be contained within the um, site lines covered by the license. Um, in terms of um, the original intention for Hands Crescent when it was pedestrianised, um, you're right, it was always envisioned to be um, a space mainly for pedestrians. We've seen over the years that the space has been used for um, other purposes. There are some tables and chairs there prior, uh, already sorry, prior to the licensing being granted last year, um, although not as many. Um, the committee may remember an application last year for a flower store associated with Harrods. So there have been other uses sort of creeping in on this space. Um, I think also the key to this is the Business and Planning Act from last year. Um, and the council had to give um, considerable weight to this when they were determining those pavement licences. There was clear steer from central government that we should be supporting outdoor dining wherever possible. Um, and in this instance, that space is, is wide enough to accommodate it um, and, and help local businesses. Um, I would add, again, condition one does restrict the time frame on this, so we're not suggesting that planning permission should be granted in perpetuity. It's just up until September 2020 when it's hoped maybe that the pandemic might be, I don't say over, but that the impacts will be much lesser. Um, should they want to continue to put tables and chairs in that location, they would have to apply again, and we could reconsider it at that point. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Councillor Doran, you had a question? The application were refused. Would the applicant still be able to use their license, whether existing or pending, to place tables on chairs on their portion? They, the they would. They would. Yes. As I say, they okay. already have deemed planning permission. So, so, um, so what is the purpose of the planning permission? What does that add? Um, speaking bluntly, um, nothing. Um, they they have permission for the tables and chairs in that location. But this isn't just about their immediate location. It's actually a much larger section of the highway. It's exactly the same section of highway as covered by the three licenses. So although there are three licenses from three different applicants in place at the moment, as I say, if you take the ownership out of it, it's exactly the same area of Hans Crescent under this application as already covered by the three licenses. Three different licenses, okay. I, I thought it added two extra chairs. Sorry, it's two extra yeah. chairs, but the area doesn't change. They're just squeezing in an extra two chairs. Yeah. Can I just ask a supplementary question? Councillor Ali first, I'm afraid. Um, sorry. Um, so no. well, sorry, Councillor Ali was, was next, and then, and then you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, this is a borderline between licensing and um, planning application issue. And I, was, I would say this sh perhaps should be with the licensing team rather than license committee rather than with the planning because it was dealing with the tables and chairs and I think what if, if I recall it earlier of, of previous meetings that we've attended in the planning mainly the outdoors have been dealt with by the licensing so uh, I don't know if this is the right application for 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 the right committee but I'm sure you with your expertise you've thought about this and you put us through it still um, I'm a bit thinking about if we were to add two more tables and chairs and already there are complaints about um, uh, the, the timing, let's say, uh, st staying up until, um, uh, you know, from 7 a.m. to um, 10 a.m. And there's a, there has been a complaint which is still ongoing. Um, is it how, how possible is it to increase the number of tables while there's already a complaint about what is already being used, which the planning have nothing to do with it, license they already have it until... September 2022, and we can't even, if, if we were to reviews this, we can't do anything about it. Um, yeah, so um, in answer to your first question, um, in, it already has been dealt with by the, 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 you know, the licensing committee in the sense that um, uh, a pavement license has, has been granted. We can't stop someone for applying for planning permission, and then we have to determine the application in accordance with the development plan. Um, which is what we are doing. Um, again, I'd advise that the planning permission, the planning application is largely um, unnecessary given they have the deemed permission in place. 
Um, in, in terms of the, um, the, the complaint that's received, um, yes, we're obviously aware of that. Um, and um, we have restricted the time that tables and chairs could be placed out. That matches the time on the license that's been granted, so they do mirror each other. Um, the, the view is that two additional chairs, given there are, um, sorry, remind me, 90 odd, 94 chairs, that two out of 94 doesn't have any material impact in terms of noise disturbance. Thank you very much. Um, Councillor Edges. Um, she just answered, I was going to talk about the timing. She had just okay. And Councillor Duren. Yeah. Speaks about heaters and umbrellas. Would those also be covered under the licensing regime as well? So it's not for the addition of those features that the, ap the application is required? Yep, the pavement licence um, includes associated furniture, so that's heaters and so on. And um, you'll notice that we have asked for further details regarding the planters um, under the condi recommended conditions. Um, so we would need those details before they could be installed to ensure that they were um, appropriately placed. Thank you very much. Well, unless there are any further questions to officers, I think we will move on. Uh, if there's any need for discussion, let us have it now. Councillor Ali, there is. The discussion is why do we have this um, uh, planning? Because if it does not make any sense, I think we sp we, we're wasting time and we should be looking at more important uh, decisions. Uh, uh, should I, be I, here, I guess. might tend to agree with you, uh, but it is here and so we need to determine it. And I think you're saying let's move on and determine it quickly. So I'm happy to do that. Um, and the recommendation before us is that the committee grants planning permission the conditions listed in section 9 of this report. Can I please see those in favour with a show of hands? Two in favour. And those against? Two against. And uh, abstentions? Okay. And I have a casting vote, which I'm voting in favour. Thank you. And we'll move on. Uh, so it's uh, Earl's Court Road. So this application concerns a property located on the corner of Earl's Court Road and Lexham Gardens within the Lexham Gardens conservation area. Um, the existing building is used as five self-contained flats and the proposal relates to two of the flats located at lower ground and ground floor level. The building already has existing extensions to the rear, um, including a two-storey glazed in full extension um, adjacent to the closet wing extension, as you can see here. Um, this ex existing extension is set back from the line of the neighbouring extension um, and it has a light well um, with steps leading up to the garden. The proposal is to replace the existing extensions and also to excavate a new basement um, beneath the existing lower ground floor. Um, it should be noted that internal reconfiguration of the flats is also proposed, but these internal alterations in themselves do not require planning permission. At ground floor level, um, the infill extension would be rebuilt um, the same size as the existing extension and metal steps would be added down to the garden level. At lower ground floor level, um, the proposal includes the excavation of a room under the garden um, to pr provide a new kitchen dining room for the lower ground floor flat with a new light well in front of the closet wing, and steps would be kept from the lower ground floor up to the garden level. And then um, an excavation of a basement would take place, which would provide additional accommodation to the lower ground floor flat, with a courtyard to the rear, providing light to the rear area. The basement would be single storey, um, and one metre soil depth would be provided above the excavation under the garden area, as shown on the section here. 
to the rear elevation, um, a traditional sash window would be installed and a window opened up to the existing um, closet wing extension. The proposed replacement infill extension would have, have a modern treatment with powder coated frames and given the enclosed location, um, officer's view is that this is acceptable. To the side elevation to Lexham Gardens, new windows are proposed. Um, you will note from the addendum report that it is recommended that a condition is to be added and um, that these should be timber framed. Documents have been submitted in accordance with the Council's basement policy, um, including a construction method statement and construction traffic management plan to address structural stability and disturbance during building works. Um, these matters are largely controlled by building regulations and the party wall act, um, but we officers are recommending conditions which would seek to reduce the impact of the construction process as far as possible, um, notably a condition requiring compliance with the council's code of construction, which would further um, control noise and disturbance. Um, finally, I would just like to draw your attention to um, the letter, which was a late representation from the planning agent, which was received um, today explaining um, that he was unable to register to speak. Um, that's all I, I need to say by, by means of introduction. Thanks very much. So, sorry, you say the agent tried to register. I hadn't seen that letter, actually. Or I hadn't read it. Um. He was, sorry, just to clarify, he, he was too late to, to register to speak. Aren't I normally asked whether I'll permit them to speak as a late registrar? Um. Yes, is the answer. Um, anyway, that's uh, by the by. Uh, he's not here. Um, so we do have two registered objectors to speak, and um, that's Mr. Ackrell and Mr. Ma. And as you've seen previously, uh, you have three minutes between you when you're ready uh, to explain why we should refuse the application. Thanks very much. Thank you, Chair. Um, it will just be me speaking today. Mr. Mark couldn't make the committee. Um, my name is Chris Ackroll. I'm a director at Town Planning Services, and I'm here to represent the owners of the first floor, second floor, and third floor apartments, which are sitting directly above the construction site. They are very concerned about the impacts of the scheme uh, on their living conditions, amenity, well-being, and enjoyment of their properties. The applications have undertaken consultation with, uh, the applicants sorry have undertaken consultation with my client and other neighbors in a minimal fashion concerns have been raised with them in 2019 and 2020 over the same scheme and yet the application has been submitted with no alterations no response to address these concerns and no additional structural information that might help to allay my client's fears to date no party wall negotiations have taken place something that the sporting text of policy CL7 strongly advises before an application is made. There is also, this is also contrary to the requirements of the Council's basement SPD. Turning to consider the technical documents, there are several areas where the documents are deficient and or contradictory. These omissions are errors that are fundamental and cannot be dealt with retrospectively by planning conditions. The construction traffic management plan prepared in May 2019 highlights that the spoil from the excavation will be removed by a conveyor system running at high level uh, behind the rear of the building and across the pavement before dropping into skips at the curbside. The duration of the works was estimated to be 65 weeks in total with 23 weeks of um, devoted to excavation. So the impacts from this construction will be endured by neighboring residents for a long time. 
The noise vibration and dust assessment refers to the store and grab method where so soil is stored on site and then removed by a grabber lorry, which contradicts the con construction management plan. The noise impact for the conveyor and the skips running at high level next to the rear of the building have not been assessed by the noise assessment. The noise impacts from the excavation works on the receptor number one at 101 Ells Court, which is the neighbouring property, were found to be borderline on the council's code of construction practice at 70 decibels over a 10 hour period. The impacts on those living directly above the construction site were not assessed at all in the document. Noise assessment applied a 10 decibel uh, discount for works contained within the structure of the building, which is how they arrived at the 70 decibels, which would suggest that even on the applicant's own figures and assessment, that noise within the building would breach your code of uh, construction practice. There are many unwanted que uh, unanswered questions with this application, as well as serious omissions and contradictions in the supporting technical documents which suggests that planning permission should not be granted. The application does not and has not fulfilled the requirements of the basement SPD, and proper consultation has not taken place, nor has there been any early engagement over the party wall or structural alterations. We are very concerned that the basement could be constructed at the same time as the other internal alterations, accepting that they don't require planning permission but it could leave my clients suspended over a three-storey void. So I politely request on behalf of the residents of the upper floors of this building that planning permission be refused in the interest of protecting their amenity, their rights to enjoy living in their property in a safe manner. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much. Thank you. And as we've heard, we don't have the applicant or the applicant's agent here. So we have no opportunity to put questions to him. But colleagues, questions to Mr. Ackrell. Any? Um, right, okay. Well, I didn't have any particular questions either. Um, really more a comment that um, this is to do with how the development is carried out and not really matters for the planning committee unfortunately whilst we do sympathise hugely with the predicament of people living underneath uh, sorry above in this instance um, major works uh, it's not a factor that we base our planning permission on, as you probably know. I think you're a planning professional. Um, so um, thank you very much. I just thought I'd make that point. Uh, oh, Councillor Wade. There, there, was, there was one, one question. Um, it's about flooding. Um, I just wondered, given the fact that we've had flooding in this particular area where we haven't had it before, um, whether that's actually been taken in, in, into consideration in, in the planning, because this is um, at a particular location where you've got the road. Um, it's close to, comparatively close to the lights. It's got a lot of wear and tear on the on, on the road, um, and there was quite. When we think about surface runoff, so the as far as I can gather, that you're going to be, they're going to take about half of the garden, aren't they? Um, and there's about one meter above, which means the permeability. And I couldn't really see how where the water was actually going to go. So that was one of one of my con concerns. Did has that ever been? discussed with you as because it will affect people above your drains um, apart, apart from anything else uh, no there's been no discussion with my clients from the applicants regarding the impact it will have on their drainage or services 
um, the site is identified. There was a flood risk assessment submitted with the application which identified the site as being medium high risk of surface water flooding. So there is an element of risk there. Um, and obviously, with recent events in, in Kensington, you know, that risk has been proven to be real in, in this area. So I hope that covers your question. Thanks very much. I don't think there are any further questions, so we'll thank Mr. Ackrell and we will move on to discuss the point um, uh, with officers. Uh, Councillor Idris. Question to officers. Um, in, in one of the letters, uh, there is um, a mention of um, two planning applications. Uh, uh, was, uh, one was objected for and the other one was withdrawn. Do you know about that? Because there is nothing on the report about these two. Um, they're dated uh, 2019 and 2021. It's uh, yes, the first it's objection. Yeah, the first letter of objection. So, yes, I mean, in... in Paragraph 4.2, it, it just it, it says, yes, that this application follows two recent withdrawn applications for similar so proposals. So the recent is the two ones that, okay. Yes, so not the two that, that, that are listed there, but two additional Yeah, that's what I'm saying, because yes. the, the ones listed are much older, 2000 and 2002. Yes. But the one, the, okay, so, so these two applications, the recent ones, they are, are they identical to what they are asking now? Um, I believe they were similar. Um, I know that I think it was the last application there was inadequate information provided, um, particularly on the construction traffic management plan, um, which was, as I understand, why it was withdrawn. So it wasn't because of what they are proposing to do as opposed to so it, they just fixed it up so that it's more acceptable or more in keeping? Is that, is that what you said? Um, th my understanding is that it was, yes, it was to do with the information that was provided rather than the proposal okay. in itself. Okay. All right. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much. Councillor Wade, you've got a question. Can we put a condition on saying that we want to see something like suds on the on the rear garden at the moment? It's it's paved. Um, uh, it a runoff is is a problem, and I can see that unless that's actually planned for, that that would be a a problem for the people above, but also because of its, its very location. Could we, could we do that? We did a um, flood risk assessment and a SUD statement with the application. Um, this refers to um, permeable surfaces within the light wells and also a attenuation tank within the rear um, garden but it would be possible to add an extra condition which just required further details of the SUDS measures. I, ju I just think that, you know, we haven't had this level of, of flooding in that particular area before, and I think this might be an opportunity to... Yes. I mean, there is condition... Sorry, just to be clear, condition nine does require um, s details of the um, sustainable drainage systems. Thank you. Councillor Wade, do you think uh, condition nine is sufficient? Do you think condition nine is sufficient or are you still proposing a further condition? It's page nine on, yes, on our pack. but it's, it's because at the present it's, it's paved and I didn't see anything in the application which stated what type of surface it was going to, the, 
the two the two meters were going to cover by whether it was going to be paved again or what that was the reason yeah, but are you, are you now content or are you proposing the addition of anything else by way of condition well i would just like to see more <laughs> information right no, I did read it. Uh, <laughs> I was just asking for clarification. Hey, that's because absolutely sometimes fine. there's not enough information. That's right. All. Okay. Uh, anyone else? Councillor Duren. It's not a double basement. No. no. Shall I just return to the section? So the building has an existing lower ground floor which is um, as do other properties yeah. within that um, terrace and the proposal then is for the basement under the existing lower ground and then for this single story um, room underneath the garden does that not effectively form a double basement then for the building no, I mean, our basement policy is, is fairly clear that it is where a building um, already has an existing basement or an existing lower ground floor that it is permitted to excavate a single storey beneath that. Okay. Thanks very much. Colleagues, how do we feel about this application? Councillor Idris, what's your view? I feel it's the same application. It's the same. Well, it's the same application they withdrew a couple of times before because they did not have any joy with their residents, with the leaseholders in that building. And and this is this is a third attempt on trying to get the same thing uh, done. Um, I always have problem with. Um, freeholders or people who want to do development and don't confer and consult with their neighbors because it's just, you know, it's just the right thing to do, I think. But then I'm old school, I'm old fashioned <laughs> in that way. Um, but I'm, 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 I'm uncomfortable. I know it's a single basement. I know we allow single basement development. Uh, I know planning wise it's okay but it, there is something about it that's just niggling me. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And um, Councillor Wade, do you have anything to add? Development. Uh, and in planning terms? In planning terms, uh, do, you, do you have any objections? I'm conscious. I, I, I would agree. W uh, I would agree that I, I just think it's kind of. I don't. I just don't feel comfortable with the application. Mm. To Thank have you. that much space for a media room. I mean, if it. <laughs> uh, I, I. Anyway. Councillor Ali, you wanted to add something. Um, <coughs> in terms of the uh, comments that we've talked about, uh, it's lower ground as normal individual or average would see it as a basement if you don't actually go into the planning details and to have a s uh, another single uh, story uh, below it it's technically double uh, uh, story as has been uh, mentioned before um, and again what also needs to be uh, taken into account is two out of the five uh, 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 residents or the people that uh, uh, floors two of them will benefit rather than three, which, of course, it does not stop us from uh, as a planning and it's not a uh, reason to object uh, in terms of the, uh, the who benefits from the basement added one and who's not. Um, having said that, um, I think what, what we have gone through in terms of the um, flooding and the basement lower, we already have a lower uh, ground and add to a basement with um, uh, the flooding we had I think we need to do more uh, to have more information about the flooding mm -hmm. and assessment so that we know uh, the area is safe also for that. And I wouldn't be comfortable in terms of, and I would like to be called it what it is and uh, to make it double uh, basement rather than to call it single. But I understand they are following the 
the technicality and they have to call it single because yeah but averagely will uh, if, if every citizen will see or residents will see this is a double basement mm. Well, certainly in planning terms, in, in our policy terms, it is a single basement. But um, yeah, I take your point. And Councillor Drone? Um, I wanted to about the rear extension push. We've talked about the basement affair, but it was also a rear extension, this as well. What impact yeah. will that have on the, the Lexham Gardens conservation area? I'm also concerned about flood risk mitigation as well, but we do need more information. Yeah. Um, okay, well, we've moved beyond the point of talking to officers about the specifics of it, um, so I, d I don't think I'll put that to um, Sarah Gentry. Um, I'm just going to have a quick word with Mr. Taylor. The point I was just discussing with Mr. Taylor is whether, uh, given that there are some concerns that are unanswered here, and given that the applicant's agent uh, tried to register to speak but wasn't able to, and, and as long ago as Friday, uh, and I'd normally be asked whether the applicant's agent should be allowed by my discretion to speak nonetheless, uh, and I know there have been problems with the telephone lines, um, uh, it seems to me that it what might be the fairest and most sensible thing to do is to defer this um, to a, a, a future committee meeting, um, hopefully not too long distant, uh, when both those points can be addressed, a little bit of further information if required, and, uh, a, and the applicant's agent can attend. So what I'm hoping is that I can get the committee's agreement to that. Uh, that's two nodding. Councillor Joan, yeah. That's a but then it will, it will will go to a different committee. Yeah. yeah. We can't guarantee it'll yeah. come back to the same five of us. The same, no. same yeah, yeah. No. Okay. Um, I think that's by agreement, so we don't need to trouble Hazel sitting at the back. Um, but um, uh, therefore, I think we will just defer that and not vote on it, if that's right. And then move to Grove House on Chelsea Manor Street, please. Thanks very much, Mr. Ackle.
Thank you, Chairman. Um, this is one of the Council's ongoing refurbishment and improvement works uh, to its housing stock. Um, just the one slide to show you, um, you can see the site there outlined in the red line, um, and then the right-hand photograph gives you um, an image of the building, um, just so you can understand its current appearance. Planning Commission has sought for new windows to all the elevations. Um, it's proposed that they would be timber framed. Um, I've not included plans on the screen in my presentation, as the scale is such that I don't think you would be able to see the proposed changes. Um, they are in your pack, but indeed, I still think it's um, quite difficult to uh, see the changes to the windows. Um, so much so that officers have recommended condition three, which would require um, further details of the windows to be submitted for approval um, at a much larger scale so we can, we can fully um, appreciate what the windows would look like. Um, but um, in principle, we're comfortable with the idea of replacing them with, with new timber frame windows. Thank you. Thank you very much. No registered speakers. So any questions to Katie Harrell on this? There's only one observation, which is I don't think it's in the Avondale Cl um, Labrador Norland Conservation Area. <laughs> yes, I, I also pointed that out in my pre-briefing, uh, and I don't think it was included in the addendum report either. Um, apologies, yes, spot. that should have, should have been corrected. Sorry about yeah. that. <laughs> um, Some serious copying and pasting, huh? <laughs> or starting from a template, yes. Um, okay, uh, I, I had one observation uh, say that I was pleased to see that these are going to be timber framed windows. Uh, other than that, uh, we're going to require details of the windows. Seemingly not very controversial otherwise, but let's see. And it's similar for similar, isn't it? Same for same. Like, like. They're, be like they're like. basically like, like for like. For like. The, the, the drawings and the submission indicate they're like for like. Condition three just gives us that additional security to make sure okay. that they, they will be, yes. And they, and they are, is it double glazed? Are they double glazed? They're not double glazed. They, w they would be double glazed, okay, yes. Great. Okay. Um, so the recommendation is that the committee grants planning permission with the conditions listed in section 10 of this report. Can I please see those in favour? Nem comp. Um, Uberdale Road, please. Thank you. Um, the application site um, is an end of terrace building adjacent to the Chelsea Ram Public House. Um, permission is sought for a single story basement, uh, which will be located to the rear part of the building. Um, there's the existing section on the left hand side with the, the demolition shown there in the shaded red, um, and then the proposed on the right hand side. The application also includes a new um, air conditioning unit, which would be located on the roof. Um, it would be sat adjacent to an existing water tank. Um, in plan, this slide just shows you the area to be excavated under the proposals. Um, I've included it just to show you that it would meet the 50% criteria as set out under the basement policy, um, and it would comply with all other parts of CL7. Um, in terms of the external manifestations of the basement, um, this would comprise just one roof light, um, which would be at the rear of the property, located adjacent to the rear wall. Um, hopefully you can make out my red arrow there. You can see it's a horizontal roof light, as I say, immediately adjacent to that rear wall. Um, the last part of the proposals are some changes to the windows at the rear. Um, so again, left-hand side shows you the existing uh, rear elevation with the right showing the proposed. Um, note at uh, the ground floor level, um, more traditional timber sash windows are proposed. And then at the lower ground floor level, you have some more contemporary um, openings. Um, and those are the slides, Chairman. Thank you very much. Again, no objections or applicants, so Councillor Wade, yeah, you can ask a question of Katie Hull. Look, I looked at this and I, I couldn't understand why uh, they wanted to have modern windows uh, at, at, it, when they were, they were, I think the one at the first floor level looks in keeping, in the closet wing, and then in the main body of the building, they're replacing it with a modern, modern, and it's just, it looks 
at least they could have kept the, the fenestration looking similar. Um, yes, I, th I think it's a, a fair point. I would just say it's quite common uh, within the borough to see a different treatment at lower ground floor level to higher up in a, a rear elevation. We tend to be a bit more flexible in terms of um, the design of, of windows and openings at the rear anyway, and particularly at lower levels. You need to bear in mind how visible that section of, of the property would be. Um, and officers after visiting the site are comfortable that there would be no um, significant views of that part of the property. Hence, we've been more flexible and, and, and thought um, at that level it, it is appropriate. But as you say, higher up, where they would be more visible from neighbouring properties, and neighbouring gardens, the timber sash proposed are more appropriate. They could have had the same type of detailing. I'm a stickler for traditional windows, as you know, Councillor Wade, but I agree with Kate Harrell that we do often see at basement level more contemporary treatments and even powder-coated aluminium windows and things like that. <laughs> um, Councillor Idris. Well, uh, the, the, the building is in a conservation area, so I was wondering, will the, uh, the different sliding doors at the bottom um, be at least the same color as the rest of the um, the, win the windows upstairs, or I mean, I um, I I've, I've learned from planning experience that a lot of people um, use sliding doors, modern ones, the ones that kind of like bring the inside outside, that kind of thing. But will it be the same color? The the plans don't specify a color, um, and officers haven't thought it was necessary to, to condition that, but it would be within the gift of members if they if they felt that that was because necessary. Because it's in the Lutz, uh, what's it, Lutz uh, Village yeah. conservation area, so... Yeah, I, I absolutely, and so there, there's a, a duty to make sure that we're preserving and enhancing that conservation area. Um, however, as I said earlier, given the limited visibility, um, officers are, are content that actually any colour in, in all likelihood would be acceptable um, and, and would preserve the character and appearance of the conservation area and the building. But um, as I say, if committee feel differently, it, w it would be possible to condition okay. further details or that the windows match. All right, thank you. Personally, I would caution against requiring that the gr lower ground floor windows are the same colour because normally traditional painted timber windows are white and often uh, contemporary sliding powder-coated aluminium or powder-coated metal are sort of dark grey or anthracite or something like that. And that is something that's worked quite well in other places. And I think actually if we conditioned that the lower ground floor sliding contemporary doors were white, they'd end up looking rather nastier and cheaper and more obvious um, than, than a sort of dark grey anthracite type colour. So uh, my suggestion would be leave it to the architect or um, whoever's, whoever's do li doing it, but um, up to other members of the committee, how they feel on that. Councillor Ali, I think you want to say that. Uh, just a quick question in terms of the building work and the dust, and since it's a conservation area and the people, the neighbouring uh, have been, uh, the effect or the impact it may have on the neighbouring since there has been uh, 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 impact before uh, in terms of the basement buildings and so on. So could you give us a bit more details about the impact of the noise and uh, the building work could cause for the neighbouring uh, properties? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. We, of course, we recognise that a, a basement excavation um, is a lengthy project that, that can cause noise and disturbance and, and, and inconvenience to those living nearby. Um, so, so we go as far as we can within planning control. You'll note that we've put... Um, a couple of conditions on, um, including the considerate construction scheme um, and our borough-wide code of construction practice. So condition seven requires um, a site construction management plan to be submitted to our um, construction management team who will review that checklist and ensure that it's implemented um, and that the, the project is built out in accordance with that plan. Um, and that covers all those sort of matters that you, you've raised. Great. Well, if there are no further questions, I think we should move to a vote, unless anyone would like to discuss anything. Councillor Wade? Yes, sir. 
condenser unit. Um, could you, can we have, I couldn't work out from the plans precisely how big it was. And the, I can see the dot, but actually, how big is it? And is it being, and, how, and, and it's the question of how it's being concealed. And um, what color is it? Hopefully this section is probably the, the easiest way to show you. So um, if you have a look, you can see the existing water tank there and, and yeah. the comparable size of that adjacent to the chimney stacks. Um, and then um, you can see that the acoustic enclosure to the AC unit um, isn't as tall as the uh, water tank and is a comparable width, I suppose. I'm afraid I wouldn't be able to give you sort of exact dimensions. And you um, know, I, just I couldn't get a sense yeah. of the, the, the size of it. So will most of it be concealed by the chimney? Most of it will be concealed. Will it be visible in from the street? It won't be visible in um, from street level views. Having walked up and down Overdale Road, y you can't see the water tank in the majority of the views. So officers are comfortable that it would be tucked in um, and, and discreet up there. So how are these guys going to service it? Um, I wouldn't like to comment. I assume that there may, may well be access. I don't think we've got a roof plan as part of the Chair. pack. Given the fact it might need servicing, is there something that we should be saying? That access, how are they going to access it? How are they going to, because it could present a problem. Well, it could, but I would suggest that that's really a matter for the applicant, how they choose to service their air conditioning unit. I think we're looking at whether mm. the appearance and sighting and um, use of the space are acceptable in planning terms. In my suggestion. I mean, I'm assuming it must be possible to get up there, whether you go up via a ladder and over the parapet, or whether you go through yeah. a trapdoor on the. How much noise? Did that sorry, Chairman. Just, make. just, just have another look at the the plans. Sorry, uh, Councillor Wade. I didn't, I didn't know um, immediately when you answered. If you have a look in your pack um, at the proposed roof plan, which is um, the last page of, of drawings, um, there is a, already an openable roof light. Um, for access to the water tank and the unit, the AC unit. Do we know? Do we know how much noise it makes? So we have had a, a noise report submitted with the application um, that's been assessed against. That, I mean, that's one of the reasons why I thought it would probably need to have maintenance if it's. That, that's the so presumably, if it does make a noise, people can complain and they do have to stop it. Yeah, absolutely. So the, the condition, our standard wording, re almost requires continued maintenance because it's worded as such that if, if it fails to meet that criteria, which usually would be due to a technical fault, um, they would have to switch it off and, until it was fixed um, and, again, could meet that noise criteria. And effectively, that noise criteria means it's not audible to any neighbouring properties. Just the protection, really. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, colleagues, the recommendation is that the committee grants planning permission with the conditions listed in section 9 of this report. Can I please see those in favour of the recommendation? All those in favour? Thank you very much. So, we move to Royal Court House. Thank you very much. So, um, continuing on the air conditioning theme, um, so the slide on the screen now shows you the whole of Royal Courthouse. Uh, it's an aerial view there. Um, if you have a look at where the red arrow is, that's the application site at flat 11. Um, hopefully you can see on that image um, that unlike its neighbours, which all feature um, sort of double roof extensions, this has a, a sort of uh, an open courtyard area. Um, and under the proposals, um, a new AC unit within an enclosure would be installed within this courtyard area. Um, you can see it on the screen there. On the right-hand side, um, you've got the elevational drawings just showing you it would be tucked up against the wall, two walls of the courtyard. Um, again, it's within an enclosure, um, and then again, we've had um, the noise report submitted by the applicant, and that has been scrutinised by officers, um, and it's demonstrated that when operating, um, that unit will not be audible to those living nearby. 
Thank you very much. Any questions, colleagues? No. Right. Well, the recommendation is that we grant planning permission with the conditions listed in Section 10 of this report, which, of course, include our normal conditions about sound, I think. Is it possible to see the location uh, of, of, of it again? Yep, um, so it's just on the on the slide uh, there for you. Um, it might be also easier to see in, in the pack the drawing is included. Yes, of course. Hang on. Uh, sorry, I know it's not particularly clear, but it's where that red arrow is. So hopefully you can just see the, the open area where that red arrow is. That, that shows you the courtyard area. Um, that's just a feature of, of that part of the building. As I say, it, its neighbours have been extended at roof level into that area. And do we know the distance between the, the condenser and the adjacent property? Um, I'm afraid I, I wouldn't be able to give you that figure. I'm sure it's very close. You can see where the, the wall is and see where the wall is on the drawing. But, um It is in an acoustic housing, and uh, we've got our normal condition regarding noise. Um, so that would ordinarily provide adequate protection. Right. Uh, I think we'll vote again. I'll try to vote in favour. OK, so all in favour. Thank you very much. Um, and Clarendon Walk and Talbot Walk. This application relates to two council-owned blocks of flats located on the Lancaster West estate, coloured orange on the plan. Um, it is coming before committee because it is council-owned. Um, the blocks are five to six storeys high, um, brick with parapets of white concrete with a dark grey coping, um, which is formed by the current waterproofing. You can hopefully just about see on the photographs the white parapets at the top of the building in the photo of Clarendon Walk here. The blocks do have various handrails and ladders at roof level, um, one of which can be seen on the left-hand photograph of Talbot Walk um, here on the slide. As part of a wider scheme to improve thermal efficiency on the estate, it is proposed to install a new roof system with insulation and a new concrete deck, which is required to support the additional load on the roof. The insulation would improve U values and it would be thicker than the existing roof buildup. As a result, um, the new roof would have an additional upstand of 0.42 metres high, which would be set back from the existing parapet. In terms of the um, overall appearance of the buildings, given the um, scale of these blocks and the overall height, the increased parapet would um, have a minimal impact upon the appearance of the buildings and the handrails on the ladders and so on would be reinstated as previously and that's just a similar um, slide for the Talbot Road walk block and there ends the presentation thank you very much colleagues Councillor Edris um, my question is um, I mean from from the from the drawings, it looks very bulky stuff being stuffed up there to keep, to insulate. Um, how much will it insulate the building by? Will it insulate it by 10% or 90%? 
Um, I can't give a, a figure, but it, in terms of percentages-wise, but it will um, improve the uh, significantly improve the thermal efficiency of of the building. If you look in the um, officer's report, it uh, in paragraph 6.4. It does explain that the U value of the existing roof is 0.228 um, and the proposed upgrade would improve that to 0.10 um, and it also does state that that would um, be beyond um, the required thermal standards. So it would be a, a significant improvement. But you, st but you still can't tell me what percentage-wise, because because I, I looked at this and it just I I I I, I don't understand kilowatts and all that. Um, my physics was a long, long time ago. Um, but I'm just concerned that um, it's a patch job. That that's that's my that's my my, my concern. It's. Um, Sometimes you, it's, 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 I don't know. I don't know how I can put it in words without coming across. It, it, just, it just feels like we're just putting up stuff to, to, to make it better, but how better is it going to be and for how long? Is there a more, um, uh, more permanent solution or? or or is, is, or is this permanent enough? I'm, I'm, I'm just not. Because it just looking at it from the picture is like filling it with a bunch of fluff and then, you know what I mean, and calling it insulation and insulate it for a while. But it's how insulated is it going to be and how much will it reduce um, heat scaping and how much will it affect uh, those who live there uh, financially in the long run? Will it benefit? Uh, of course it will benefit them a little bit, but how much I, I would rather have some kind of percentage quantification so I can feel, okay, we did this, it's not the greatest looking thing, however, it is reducing the heat by X percent. I think those are issues that arise on any retrofit of um, insulation to an old building, aren't they? Uh, and it may be rather difficult for Sarah to answer those questions with any figures. I don't think they're given in the report. Uh, I'd suggest that we ought to be looking really at what's before us rather than um, looking too far behind it and, and trying to work out um, whether it might have to be redone in the future. I, mean, I entirely take your point that it would be unsatisfactory if that were the case. And um, I, I think the, the, the thing that's safer in planning terms is whether we consider as you say, th this not great looking addition, uh, acceptable or unacceptable. But um, what's before us has been sold to us as a great, is, as a, as a improvement. An improvement, and, yeah. You know, and is it, imp I want to quantify that improvement, that's all. Mm. Well, uh, maybe Sarah has something to add, but let's see. Um, it was simply not not really t um, further than I I've said that it it is it is a improvement which will exceed um, current standards. I don't know if Mr Taylor has anything he wishes to to add to that. Um, well, not really. I, th I think that that and the the chairman's previous statements has sort of summed it up pretty well. Um, I mean, I was, I was only going to just, just point out that the, the works actually are subject to funding from, from the Green Homes Grant. So in, in terms of who bears the costs, um, as long as the Green Homes Grant exists, I mean, that, that will take up some of that strain. Um, in, in terms of the benefits, I mean, the building regulations and environmental requirements will get tightened in the future. So this, this may not be the end of the story. Um, ultimately, the planning system it does need to facilitate the upgrading of buildings as standards will undoubtedly get tougher in the future. So it may not be permanent, but at least it's a step in the right direction. 
Thanks very much. Councillor Wade, I think you wanted to add something. Um, I just have a, qu a query about the materials uh, of the uh, insulation and also the encasing material. Because the construct of the building is, when, when was the building? It was built. It's about, it's about 1970s, it? 70s, I think, yes. Yeah, 1960s. So it's a combination of, of brick. So brick, yes. And, and so the roof material, uh, what is that made out of? That would be some grey um, waterproofing membrane, um, as is the existing treatment because the membrane can be quite delicate can't it it can be quite vulnerable so how we got need kind of slightly more specification on that because that can be quite um i couldn't see it could you can I be yes i mean that would obviously if we've got the upstand and the height and the waterproof cap, but actually, I would have liked to have seen slightly more detail on that. That's all. <coughs> Thank you. Right. Okay, well, I think that's questions over. So, um, move to discussion. Councillor Ali has a point you'd like to make. Thank you. I, I understand what uh, I'm sure councillors, uh, uh, their point is coming from. I think it would have been great to have uh, uh, more details in terms of even we had one section, uh, the existing one didn't have the exactly the thickness or what was required to compare with the one, we, the, the proposed one we had, to 420 millimeter thickness for what's proposed. But what do we compare with? Having said that, I'm sure the officers would, would have would have been good if they were to give us not only uh, the material required but also the thickness. Uh, but in the meantime, it's uh, council property and it's uh, well overdue for insulation and I think uh, it's about time to, to, to get on with it and perhaps ask for uh, more details um, to share with the committee and um, for the type of material they're using, the comparison, if that is something we can have as a details, but I'm sure it will be uh, beneficial to the residents to, to to grant uh, this application as it stands. Thank you, Jeff. So possibly we want to add something requiring details of the materials. And at the moment, condition forces materials to match existing. Yeah, I, th I think, Chairman, we need to be very careful here that such a condition stays within the realms of town planning. I mean, uh, essentially, planning permission is required for the raising of the upstand, but the actual detail of the roof and materials behind that upstand in themselves don't require planning permission. And I caution, I'm not sure what, what it would add to the process if the planning authority were requiring details of materials that would anyway need to satisfy the building regulations. Yeah. Well, I, I think that's quite wise, Mr Taylor. Um, <laughs> Um, so, um, perhaps, perhaps we leave that to the building regulations regime. Um, colleagues, otherwise, uh, no further points. Okay, in which case it's recommended the committee grants planning permission with conditions listed in section 9 of this report. Can I please see those in favour? And those against? And those abstaining? One. Did you vote, Councillor Wade? Oh, you're, you are against. Okay. Um, so, there we are. Three in favour, one against, one abstention. Thanks very much. And we um, move to Averna Court. This site is a mansion block located on the south side of Averna Court and the east of Averna Gardens. And the application relates to the top floor flat on the northeastern corner, um, which is outlined in red. 
you can see it better on this image, which shows the front elevation to Averna Court, um, with the elevation onto Averna Gardens to the side. Um, the changes um, that are proposed um, are in connection with the use of the flat roof, um, where that arrow is pointing as a terrace um, with installation of railings and a new door. Um, this image is, is looking down onto that flat roof. Um, it's located above a dormer window to the front elevation, and you'll see that it is the roof is partly enclosed by chimneys to the side and rear. There is an existing window in place, um, which is the one which, is, which it is proposed to change to a door. Um, this is the roof plan. Um, it is proposed to erect railings onto this flat roof. Um, they will be set back from the edge of the roof by 800 millimetres. Um, you should note that permission was previously refused for a similar proposal in 2015, um, but this proposal sets back the railings further um, to reduce their impact. And then um, this it, photograph shows the window, which it is proposed to change to the door. That's looking east, so towards Wrights Lane. And then one photograph looking the other way um, towards the northwest. The railings that are proposed would be metal railings painted black um, with the French doors timber framed and painted um, as the existing and proposed elevations show. And there is the eleva similar elevation to Iverna Gardens. And um, there, there ends the presentation. Thank you very much. Nourish, speakers, uh, questions? Councillor Idris. Um, I have a couple of questions. Um, um, how, uh, maybe I missed it, but how, how large is the area, uh, the, ter the, the proposed terrace area? What's the, what's the dimensions? Bear with me for a moment. I'm just going to turn to the roof plan, which is within the um, proposed pack which includes a, a scale. You, you may want to turn to it um, yourself. Um, it is approximately, you'll appreciate this is an approximate um, five meters, possibly six meters by two meters. So I would say um, no more than, than 10 meters, 10 meters square. square meters. Yeah. And in your view, do you feel the 800 millimeters is safe enough a space? If it's for the railing, isn't it, or something? And um, the 800 meters refers to the setback from the edge of the roof. From the edge, yeah. Is that is that safe enough? Is that far enough? Um, in terms of safe, in terms of the visual impact, it would reduce the visual impact of the of the railings they would the railings would be 1.1 meters high which is the standard dimension um under building regulations which is the um figure to ensure safety for the users and my final question are there any other uh, roof terraces like this in either Iverna gardens or Iverna court not that i am aware of Obviously, this is a fairly, because of the position of this roof, it's, it's, it's quite unusual. Um, I'm not aware of any others. Okay. Thank you. If there are no further questions to Sarah, are there any points that colleagues wish to discuss? Councillor Wade. Um, are these railings um, similar to other railings, or 
in the area, or is that the, or is it just indicative? Because there seems to be on on the drawing, there seem to be other railings indicated, and I just wonder whether they were just indicative, or whether or not the applicant is actually going to have the same kind of railings, style of design of railings, as in in the same area. That does sound like a question to Sarah. I notice on the um, proposed Or is it too hard because there are not enough railings in the immediate area? Well, if you look at the proposed elevations in the pack, you can see railings on another uh, flat to the left and, and to the I'm right. Ju I'm just saying, if, because this is going to act as a precedent, so potentially, so that... Actually, it would be nice if it's uh, because it is a, those buildings are unique. They go do go round in a uh, in in the same format. That is, if is there is a railing style, it would be nice for that to be continued. That's all. Yeah, it's a fair point actually. They're, they're quite fancy what's proposed here, uh, and then there are some others which have sort of got a wave in them um, to the left and right looking at the proposed elevations. I just wonder whether um, they might be better plain because we're trying to minimize the impact, the visual impact of this terrace rather than maximize it. And I think plain is always fairly safe. I think we could do that by way of condition. It's not a major change. If, if colleagues thought that that would be sensible to keep them plainer. Councillor Rogers agrees, Councillor Wade. Do you think planar is better for the, the style of the railings? Do you think planar better? Yeah, well, I, I think so as well. Um, Councillor Ali. Okay, um, any other views on the style of the railings then before we move on to Councillor Ali's other point? It, it sounds as though colleagues generally think planar would be better uh, and certainly black metal painted. Yeah. Yeah. Councillor Ali. Um, yeah, in terms of the application has been rejected before, and uh, but the comment section uh, mentions that uh, it still uh, remained unsolved, the reasons that have been uh, rejected. However, the response from the council officers were that this application form has now addressed the reasons that the previous um, application was rejected. Can you give us a bit more details about the two uh, comments uh, that we have here on the application form. So the previous proposal um, included the use of the roof, the whole of the roof, without the railings being set back. And there was concern um, that those that included the use of the roof immediately above um, the dormer window, which you can see on the photograph here, um, which as I understand, it belongs to another flat, so which is why um, it is now proposed to set that back to reduce the impact. Thank you. That's, that's, that's helpful. Thank you very much. It's not what, because one of the letters here stated the fact that uh, it was refused is because it did not fit the with Edwardian style uh, I just want to be yeah this is a similar uh, this is similar to a previous proposal uh, and not sympathetic to the Edwardian building so it's not it doesn't have to do with that with that it is it's because it was on top of somebody else's window that's why it was refused in 2015 yes I would have to double check that there was not another because reason I'm, I'm for just, refusal. I'm, I'm just concerned that having this terrace built or, con yeah, well, uh, uh, formed up um, is actually not sympathetic with the Edwardian building in, in, in some sense. And that's why I asked initially if there are any other terraces similar in Iverna Court or Iverna Garden. Because if this is the first one, 
Um, well, there appears to be something with railings in that elevation that I showed you in the pack. But there, is, there are balconies. There are small balconies, like the Juliet type of balconies, most around there. But I'm just concerned this is the first terrace in that sense, in that style. Um, yes, so I, I can answer the question now. So the previous um, application was refused for one single reason, was, and that was um, the proposed development, because of the position of the metal railings, um, would lead to significant noise and disturbance to the detriment of the living conditions of adjoining properties. So that it wasn't refused um, because of appearance. So, okay, so explain to me how is 800 meters a little bit, how 800 millimeters depth is going to reduce the noise? Well, I think because it is now no longer on the roof of that, um, that dormer window. But in some of the letters, they're talking about noise coming from the roof garden, which is all the way by, uh, you know, the Japanese um, store. And that is way almost a block and a half further down. They can hear noises. So how, is, how are you going to, how is that, do you see what I'm saying? How is that different? If yes, it, I mean, if it's the noise. Certainly, I, I think we have to, to bear in mind that um, that it's often noise and disturbance from the use of roofs is very much down to how the space used. is used by the residents um, rather than the space itself. This is a, a relatively small um, terrace and um, people's behaviour um, tends to be the cause of disturbance rather than the, the existence of the roof terrace in itself. Okay, thank you. All right, well, does anyone have any points that they want to make? No, okay, well, let's vote on the recommendation before us. The recommendation is that the committee grants planning permission to conditions listed in the section 9 of this report, uh, and we were going to change the railings to plain railings, not fancy railings. I see those in favour of that recommendation with that amended condition. That's three in favour. Uh, against? Two against. So that's granted. Thank you very much. Um, and Boyne Terrace Muse, please. We move on to this application for a, um, which relates to a single family house on the southern side of Boyne Terrace Mews. Um, you will see on the site location plan um, that to the rear of the site is the Flats Kent House um, with their parking area immediately to the rear. Um, planning permission is sought for a mansard roof extension and alterations to the front and the rear of the building. Um, this is the existing building, a two-story brick building with critter window to the front elevation. Um, and you'll note that existing window um, at first floor level, which breaks through the front parapet. And um, the front parapet is lower in height than, than the rest of the street. Um, and you can also see on this photograph the building to the east being the vehicular entrance to Kent House to the rear of the site. And then the building to the, to the west, so that's to the left-hand side of the photograph, also has a higher parapet. Um, the existing building has a low double-pitched roof. In general, Boyne Terrace Mews is, is mixed in character, um, with several of the properties being recently um, rebuilt. Um, 
there are two properties immediately to the east, that's numbers eight and nine, um, are two-storey only, and permission was refused and dismissed on appeal in 2014 for a mansard at number nine. And then in terms of the rest of the group, um, the property that has a mansard extension is number 10, which you can see towards the left of the photograph. Um, this was granted permission in 2018, so crucially after the appeal at number nine, um, and it did replace an existing part width roof extension. And then number 11, which you can see on the far side to the left, um, has a pitched roof, but it does have fairly substantial dormers to the front and to the rear. Um, this shows the view from the street, and you'll note that existing mansard at number 10, and then the dormer at number 11. And then just to explain the context, looking the other way within the street, so this is looking west, um, the only other property that has a mansard is number six to the rear, um, which has a mansard profile to the rear. Um, the other properties have pitched roof profiles. Um, though you will, of course, note the higher parapet, which I have already pointed out to this building um, leading to Kent House, shown here. And then just looking down on those properties that we've just seen from the street scene, um, here, just picking, showing again that mansard at number six and the pitched roofs of the other properties. Um, the proposal is for a mansard. As I said, it would raise the height of the front parapet and also alterations um, would are proposed to the front doors and windows. The doors and windows would be timber with the mansard roof in slate and three dormer windows clad in lead. And this shows you the, the rear elevation. In terms of profile, the mansard would be set behind a front parapet to the front, um, and this traditional profile would help reduce its prominence from the street, and to the rear, it would stem directly from the um, rear wall, the rear elevation, which is similar in profile to the existing mansard slope at number six, which you can just see in the far left-hand side of the photograph. And there ends the, the presentation. Thank you very much. No speakers, colleagues, questions to Sarah? Councillor Idris? I've, I've written some notes here and I'm trying to figure out what, do, what, I, what they mean, but there is a door um, to, private yard, to the private yard never um, used or no, it's not usually used. Is that, am I reading correctly? I read it somewhere. I can't remember where. I should mark my notes better. Drawings showed um, a, a, a gate into the um, Kent House car park, um, which was subsequently removed from the drawings in response to objectors' comments. Okay, all right, thank you. Councillor Wade, do you have anything to say? Am I right that this is almost a complete rebuild? This is not a refurbishment, this is actually just rebuilding a house. They have submitted demolition drawings. Um, it's correct that there is internally some of the walls would be removed. Um, and obviously to 
the roof would need to come off because it's a, a proposed mansard um, with some areas of brickwork where the new windows would come in. However, um, the floor and ceiling of the main building would retain as, as well as um, the majority of the front and rear elevations. So the proposal is for an alteration rather than for... But, the, but, the, but, the, but forgive me, but the front elevation is completely different. It's like the one at number 10 now rather than the one it presents at the moment. And the rear of the building is completely different. So uh, if, if you turn in your, in your pack, we've included, I don't have them on the screen, but we have included demolition drawings um, within the pack of drawings, which shows the, the extent of demolition. It's clearly a very substantial refurbishment, but it seems to me that it's probably warranted looking at the building, um, both front and back. Uh, I do note the points made by the um, uh, Gladbrook Association about the size of the windows. They are going to be quite large, but I still think on balance that it's a, an improvement over what's there. Any other points, colleagues? Otherwise, we'll move to a vote. The recommendation is to grant planning permission with the conditions listed in section 10 of this report. Can I see those in favour, please? Show of hands. And against? Abstentions? Abstaining? Are you in favour? <laughs> that was all in favour, please. Yeah. And then we move to Tavistock Crescent, please, finally. So this application relates to the lower, a lower ground floor flat in Tavistock Crescent. The properties currently have a garden area um, fronting onto Tavistock Crescent, um, but the current access to the flats is internally. Permission is sought for a new gate um, within the front railings, which would enable access um, from the street. And steps would be provided um, down into the garden, um, which you can see on the section. Finally, it's proposed to replace the existing door and window um, with a new window, and this would be timber framed and um, controlled by condition. And there ends the presentation. No speakers, no objectors, no applicant. Any questions, colleagues? Quite a lot more support than there are objections in writing, I note. Seems a good idea to me. In which case, uh, committee, uh, the recommendation is that the committee grants planning permission with the conditions listed in section 9 of this report. Can I see those in favour? All in favour. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone, very much indeed.